So I might uh, begin by uh, introducing myself. I'm Arthur Stewart. I've been an academic for 34 years. And um, although I'm in the twilight of my academic career, um, I've hopefully got one or two productive years left. And uh, one of uh, my passions is uh, measuring the human body and hopefully making some sense out of the value of those measurements. And the reason you're all here is that you're learning how to train other people to make shoulder breadth measurements and indeed to learn how to make them yourselves. And there's no point in measuring anything at all unless we can assign a value to the measurement numbers that we get. So all of today is really focused on one thing and that is basically to quality assure the measurements that we make. So if we think about um, a high precision piece of engineering, this will have a tolerance that is a very small error that is tolerable um, and that will pass a certain test. In the same way, we would like to train you to be as good as you can be with three hours of training and you can expect to impart that training to other people as well. Um, <clears throat> this morning is really going to be about uh, teaching you the theory of why we're doing, doing the measuring and how we're doing the measuring. And then after I've spoken for maybe about half an hour, then we're going to divide into pairs and we're going to start measuring one another. And I will measure everybody in the room and everybody will measure everybody else in the room. And because of that, you will get the maximum exposure to different shaped shoulders and get comfortable with this idea of measuring in a valid way. Um, we will give you correction and advice on how to measure more accurately. And we have a protocol that we'll be sticking to, which I will, I will say something about. I'll say something about the measuring devices, which uh, I will pull out and get you to have a closer look at uh, in due course. Um, I will also conduct an exam, possibly without you realizing it's really an exam, because basically I will pull each of you out and measure each of you, and I will make a note of the results, and then you will continue to measure one another. And then I will ask for that submission, and it will go into my spreadsheet, and it will calculate what we call the technical error of measurement. So then, assuming everybody gets through the exam, we'll uh, forward your details uh, for the Vantage uh, database. So that's the, um, the bit as far as you're concerned, but beyond that we will also give you information of how you conduct a measuring course. Now <clears throat> I've got three qualifications I suppose in teaching, um, but I learned more being a ski instructor than I did at any sort of formal qualifications. And one of the things that you learn is that you will sweep in a lighthouse fashion from one person to the other. So there's nobody in your audience you're ignoring. You're actually capturing everybody. And you learn to say just three things in any session so that the three things they'll go away with are hopefully the, the more, most important things. So the reason we're here, quality assured measuring, we're going to tell you about the what and the when and the why and the how. That comes next. So. <clears throat> we are here to train trainers for bideltoid breadth. The deltoid is a muscle in the shoulder. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but we're training people to train others to measure the, the bideltoid breadth, which is a measure of the shoulder breadth. Um, so why, what, how, uh, how to measure and how to record the result. That's what we have in store for today. So the first question is we're probably all very well aware, why are we bothering with this? Well the answer is this directive um, from the Civil Aviation Authority, CAP 1145, um, which followed um, a, a tragic uh, helicopter uh, accident, which recognised the attributable um, effect of body size in successful or otherwise escape through helicopter windows. So it then made a large number of recommendations, one of which was the compatibility of a person's size with the window they are seeking to egress through. And these were the push-out windows um, for uh, emergency exits. Okay? So we needed to design a, a measuring program which provides the right 
information to say this person is of this size and this other person is of a different size. And it, you might think how straightforward this is to say, well, the big people are all on this side of the room and the small people are here. It's actually much more difficult than it sounds to say how to designate uh, large or broad people from uh, regular sized people, okay? Because you've got to demonstrate your competence and your precision and your uh, allowable uh, tolerances, if you like. So we designed a strategy where, <clears throat> as a criterion anthropometrist, there are 15 of us now in the world. Um, I train people who are trainers who train, e each trainer will train measurers, and each measurer can measure the bideltoid. And of course, I can measure the bideltoid, and so can a trainer measure the bideltoid. But there's 67,000 people that need measuring, and they needed to be measured within three months of a date that the CAA set us. So we managed to get everybody measured. Um, so this is the idea of the hierarchy of the scheme. Okay. What measure? Okay. So if we think about what is most limiting in terms of a person's ability to egress through a small space. If you look at a UK manhole cover, it's 57 centimetres across in diameter. And the naive approach would be to suggest if you can get down the manhole cover, you can get back up. Well, that's really fine unless you pass out down the manhole cover and then somebody needs to come past you to rescue you. Okay, so it's not always simple. And of course, they, they have issues with air quality down there. So it's not just about do you fit, it's can you be rescued from where you, you actually end up. But we recognize that shoulder breadth is the accepted anatomical dimension which most limits our egress through confined space. It's suitable for measuring men and women because that's really important. Um, we've done some work in men with chest depth as well. Okay, and that's that adds something to shoulder breadth as well. But obviously it's not suitable for measuring women, but they buy men. <laughs> um, it's more reliable than other measurements, okay? So if we d decided we wanted to do a thoracic depth measurement, then this is going to change every breath you take, whereas your bideltoid breath changes very little, maybe five millimeters uh, uh, maximum. We measure against the skin surface rather than measure against clothing, because if I measured through your clothing, then you could ask me quite legitimately, how thick is my clothing and how much do I take off to account for the thickness of two layers of clothing? And the answer is unknown, so we will measure to the skin, but you could probably compress the skin a bit, but as soon as you start to compress the skin, you've got to measure the force with which you're compressing the skin, because if you don't do that, then the question is, how springy, how spongy could we be? How curved is the shoulder girdle? So that is a can of worms, which we're not even going to open. So we need to compress the surface in order to have a reproducible measurement that you can then do. And all we have to do is standardize the body position. So I'm going to come on to that in a minute. The anatomy of the shoulder is such that we have the deltoid muscle, you might want to just sit there and put one hand on the opposite shoulder. And then if you then lift that arm just to the side a little bit, it can be bent, it can be straight. What you're feeling is the deltoid muscle working. And there are three lobes to the deltoid muscle. This one is the right deltoid. This is the front of the thorax. This is the back. And this is the shoulder blade or the scapula bit there. So you have a posterior, superior, and anterior deltoid, and they're sort of like banana shape, okay? And, uh, you know, if you're very well strength trained, you can see these uh, individual uh, muscle uh, lobules there. So that's the anatomy of the, so sh of the shoulder. What I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you now is the, uh, the instrument. Now, <clears throat> it's my guess that the majority of you will have been measured with this. Yes? Yeah. Okay, so this is an infant length measuring rod, customized for our purposes, in order to meet the CAP 1145 requirement. We had to f source a thousand of these, 
within two weeks, okay? So there are people that I would have said, we could do better than this. I've got some really nice measuring equipment, but it'll take six months to come, and there's only a stock of 20 in the Swiss factory where it's made. We needed to move fast with this, so we went for a German manufacturer, and these are ubiquitous. And the only thing we've done is we've customized them with a double cable tie, which is a cursor which stays put once you've measured. So this is our instrument, and it's designed to be screwed to the wall if you want to use it for measuring sitting height, for example. Um, but it's flexible, it folds flat, and it's got large areas that you can um, measure from. So it's, it's, a, it's the right instrument for the, the, the purpose we need. It's a, it's, it's a fair bit longer than we need it to be, <clears throat> but it, it was the right thing to buy. So that's uh, the Seeker. 207 large sliding caliper. We've modified it by adding these cable ties. So there are two cable ties, and these occasionally come off. <clears throat> I think most installations have got a stock of cable ties, but this is just allowing it without you measuring, without you seeing the scale. You can measure something, and this then tells you where you measured to. That's actually quite an important part of the measuring process because if I I'm close to the, the 55.9, which is here. And I'm getting the sense that this person either wants to be an XBR or wants to not be an XBR. I can be very influenced by that process as I measure. We're human beings, we're, and I have measured an awful lot of people over the years. Um, and people will invest some emotion in what that outcome is. So it's a far more objective thing for us to be able to do, to measure blinded, so I can't see the scale from the way I'm holding the device. And yes, I'm going to be holding the device like this, and I'll teach you how to do this in a minute. But I can't see the result at the time I say this is the measurement. I then slide this back up, flip it up, and read it with my glasses on in my case. Okay, so you can see that that's a bit more objective than thinking, oh, I could make sure that you're XBR or non-XBR because I can see the numbers. So this is a bit more uh, objective. So that's the device. And of course, we are reading um, the scale to the nearest millimeter. Um, and we are following a protocol which I wrote with a professor of ergonomics down in New Zealand. Um, and the protocol is just the, sp the specification for how we conduct the measurement, okay? So we are measuring to the skin surface, uncompressed, and the presentation of the uh, males may be measured bare-chested, females are not to be bare-chested. Um, they are required to wear a sleeveless top or equivalent garment, providing access to this area, okay? That's fine stands erect with feet together, arms against the sides and elbows in, so the elbows are touching the sides, thumbs pointing forward, that's what we call the mid-prone position. If you stand with your arms relaxed, your elbows will be away from your um, torso surface. You've got to forcibly put your elbows in, thumbs pointing forwards, resting on the lateral thighs, okay? Measure a position, stands in front of the participant, but with the, the right sort of eye line, so you need to see the height of that deltoid. So you may need to go down a little bit, you may need to stand just fully upright, depending on the relative heights, okay? And we can record um, to at least 0.1 of a centimeter, that's the nearest millimeter, and in some devices that I have upstairs, we can actually get to half of a millimeter, or 0.05. And this is an important point as well. It's after you breathe out normally. It's not a maximal expiration. It's a... When we have our lungs in typical lung volumes between four and a half and five and a half liters, you're only using 0.8 of a liter nearly all the time at rest. So you're using the, the mid-range of your lung variability and you're just breathing out normally, but not forcing everything out. And that will standardize the, the position and also the elevation of the shoulders. Some people will um, move their shoulders as they breathe. Other notes for measurement. <clears throat> we can recognize, you might just be able to make this out. 
there are <coughs> that's the, uh, four muscles of the upper arm. If we count the deltoid in, in that category, we obviously have the biceps, we have the triceps, um, so biceps in blue, triceps in yellow. We have another one called the brachialis muscle, which is behind, which is below the triceps. But the triceps inserts around the side and underneath the deltoids, which come over the top. Okay. Um, and you can actually palpate that on yourself. When we talk about palpation, we mean physical touching of the skin surface. Okay. And what's really important before you actually touch any of each other is you tell people what you're going to do. So you're almost pre-warning them that the touching is a necessary part of measuring and you almost give them permission to react. And, and if they don't want it, then they have that opportunity to react. I would imagine that the vast majority of the offshore workforce are not sort of particularly bothered about that sort of behavior. Because again, the whole process is designed to enhance safety. Okay, so elbows against the torso, which makes the deltoid most more prominent but you can actually feel where the deltoids come to you can feel the triceps around the side biceps here and the junction of these muscles you can actually uh, palpate yourself and it's a, a sort of a, a leaf shape if you like the uh, lateral deltoid um, not <clears throat> uncommon for some in, uh, individuals to have um, different heights left and right you can be injured you can have a skeletal injury not just a muscle injury and that there's a different height if this occurs we take the measurement horizontally from the higher side okay we just need to standardize that um, for extremely tall or short individuals the measurer may stand or sit on a box I can bring an anthro box down um, we might be able to stand on these chairs I would be a bit more comfortable with standing on a purpose designed strong wooden box um, which I can bring down from the lab if we need it um, but we want to try and preserve a horizontal eye line for measuring otherwise we'll have what we call a parallax error a parallax error is when I'm trying to read um, an ordinary watch from an angle rather than f at 90 degrees to the face it's the reason why um, let's say couples fall out about how fast the car is going because the driver is looking at the gauge straight on and the person in the passenger seat is looking at an angle which incurs parallax error so the needle is not is above the numbered surface dial so you are getting distortion of what the true fact is because you're not looking at it straight parallax error may also affect this if you don't have a near horizontal eye line which is why you need to get down into the right position for um, many many of you make, making those measurements we can actually bring a box down and uh, start to measure now in a well muscled person like this it's very easy to see where the deltoid will come to but we get probably more people like this than like this and that requires us to standardize the position in as far as we can and there are people who are very difficult to measure, but all we do is the best we can sticking to the protocol. Okay? The protocol is designed to make it easy and also valid. So um, the biggest challenge, if you like, is somebody whose torso is, let's say, flared, maybe the wrong way up, and their arms, the lower down the arm you measure, the wider the, the arms will be. <clears throat> but the definition is a deltoid which the deltoid muscle only comes to here. So if you're measuring down here, that's not the deltoid muscle, therefore it is not the bideltoid breadth. Okay. So those are some notes for measurement. <clears throat> and when you're teaching this to people you are wishing to measure, you can explain um, the bideltoid breadth measurement itself. Um, you can explain the position as I've described, end of a normal breath, elbows into the side. Um, you can demonstrate the use of the measuring device, which we're going to start using in a moment. And we don't just measure once, we measure twice or three times. And if we measure twice, they need to be within 1%. And we would take the mean of those two measures. If they are not within 1%, 
then we will measure a third time and take the median. And as you will remember, the median is the middle. We throw away the highest and lowest and keep the middle one. The reason we do that is because if you've made a mistake, let's suppose I'm measuring it, Paul. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to be measuring you, and I'm guessing you are 47.8. Okay? But I write down 37.8. Okay? I'm human. I make mistakes. I've got 47.5, 47.9, and 37.8. If I take the mean of those three, the error I've made is bundled into that measurement, which goes into Vantage. If I take the median of those three, I am much closer to the truth. You see the, see the difference? So median of three, mean of two, if those two are within 1%. Okay. Now we have a spreadsheet that does this automatically for you, and I'm just going to show you it just now. So this is on <clears throat> a file called Biodeltoid Measurement Pro Forma Brackets Vantage, and this is on the pen drives, which you will take away with you. And it, it looks slightly different. We've got slightly wider units here. But it's designed that you could print it out and write it out in pencil. Um, so each digit gets a box in this one, and this is supposed to be a decimal point. And the number here, I measured a 54.6, 55.3, and it tells you the percentage difference. So, and do I need a third measure? Yes, because they're 1.3% different. So I'll type in some numbers, and you can see those numbers change. So if I looked at getting a 54.8, and I hit return, they are only 0.4 of a percent difference. Can you make that out from where you are? So those are only different, so third measurement, no. And this is measure, the measurement result. It's calculated it for you. Oh, I've actually got a third one in, so I, I shouldn't have, I should have cleared that. So that will then change to 54.7, which is the mean of those two. But if I then <clears throat> change this to 55.6, so that's going to be close. So yes, so I do need a third measure. So I'm going to go up to 55.4. So that has chosen the middle of those three as my measurement result. So this is just um, what we call conditional formatting in um, Excel. You all au okay with that? So it's just a, a lookup type function. If all of that. So it takes the, the average or the median of those three. And that does it for you, and that's the result that is recorded. So that's a wee aside. So, so I'm going to go on to errors of measurement. So we've mentioned that the person needs to be standing with the arms by the sides, elbows into the side, and we are looking for this convex shape here at the deltoid. The deltoid will come to about here. Okay, this is um, the anti-cubital fossa, which is where you would give blood from, here. So we're really talking about just over a third of the way from the acromion, the bony notch at the top of your uh, scapula. That's the acromion there. And this is the anti-cubital fossa here. So we're talking about there. The deltoid is only going to come a little bit here, but the widest part is where we measure to. Okay. So there should be a convex surface. Okay. Um, that convex surface doesn't really appear unless our elbow is in, into the side. And we mentioned that the thorax will expand with breathing. The measurer should observe this at the end of a normal breath. So some people will breathe much more forcibly. And when you mention the word breathe normally, that paradoxically triggers bizarre breathing behavior. So the best thing is you just don't mention it, you just observe it. So if you say, just breathe normally, they go <sighs> so, <clears throat> so that's another point. Um, <clears throat> again, you need to impart the ideas that the true value will change by one or two millimeters because of breathing. The true value will not be measurable because you are not a perfect measurer. 
um, because you need to measure against the skin without compression, and that's not always easy with these devices. Um, we have measuring relative to repeated measures we make ourselves. We have measuring errors related to the difference between two people measuring the same person. So, okay, um, this is um, PJ Barron, who's come to help us and lend his shoulders uh, to the process. And as a former Olympian, um, he's got good shoulders. So uh, we all enjoy measuring his uh, shoulders. So, so we have me measurement error as a result of within measurer error and between measurer error, which tends to be slightly larger. Um, and the calculation in the spreadsheet will, will directly uh, calculate both of those errors. And you need to pass error tolerance targets for both within measurer and between measurer error, what we call uh, intra and inter tester error. Okay. Um, so the statistical calculation is all done for you automatically using the spreadsheet and we call it the TEM or the technical error of measurement. And that is achievable for nearly everybody with the right training. So <clears throat> we're coming to the end of the sort of lecture a bit and we're going to very shortly get going with starting to make measurements. We ask um, the participant to uh, assume the, the required position and we observe a, if a convex surface exists. Um, we can view it from different angles. The sort of surface topography, for want of a better word, does change between people. It changes between men and women. Okay? And the topography is also affected by the compression of soft tissue in some people. So put it like this. Um, in some people, the cross-section of the arm is nearly circular. In other, it is a flattened D shape, okay? Because we are compressing against the torso. So this is a straight line and this is a semicircle, okay? So that, that shape will vary. If we can't see this convex surface, we can ask them to supinate and pronate and that will incur the, this muscle and they can actually see where it comes to so they can see where they're going. They can uh, palpate, but you need to ask permission. Is it all right if I physically touch? Um, so palpation is <clears throat> uh, touching the skin surface and we can tell where that muscle boundary is. Um, we can palpate the muscle as a measurer, but it's easier if they generate resistance. So you've got one hand resisting them, the other hand palpating, and then you can feel what this muscle is trying to do as it's working, and you can find it where it is. And you can mark it with a dot using a ballpoint pen um, on the skin if you find that easier, and you can measure to where that mark is. Uh, in the majority of people, it is not necessary to mark the skin. But if it helps, you can do it. Don't use a permanent marker or you might actually lose a friend in that process. When we make the measurement, and we will leave this, maybe this one on the screen as we practice, we face the participant, we widen the calipers, or maybe just demonstrate with this, on an imaginary person. Nobody will be of more than 75. So if I make it wider than the widest person, okay, um, <clears throat> we observe the convex surface, as I've said. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to find one of the deltoids and I'm going to support the base of this ring with my middle finger. And then I'm going to slowly observe, I'm moving this just a little bit. I can move it rapidly until it approaches the skin, but I'm moving it then just a millimeter at a time by pushing this along here, okay? I've then touched the, the surface of the person. I'm calling that the measurement. I take it out carefully and I flip it up, slide this up and then read it, but I'm reading it at the right-hand side of the edge of what I can see there. The right-hand side because that's what it's uh, pushed to here. And I do that at least another time and perhaps uh, a third time as well. Okay. so. 
I think the time is now uh, for us to start uh, getting used to the instrument and, and starting to measure. So there are five participants in the course. We have an extra person in, uh, in the form of PJ to take part. Um, so we're going to sort of initially begin with um, a demonstration. Um, and with PJ, if you could uh, maybe pop your vest on and then come, come out to the front, we'll maybe get that on camera. And then we'll form you into pairs and we'll just get you practicing measure. We're not going to write down the numbers, we're just going to get used to using the device. And I will need my glasses on. So, first thing I'm going to do is get you to stand and maybe move you back a little bit so you can see there. Perfect. So it's feet together, hands there, elbows in, touching the torsos, and I'm not going to say anything about breathing. He is breathing, I'm hoping. I'm widening this to 72. I don't think we're anywhere near that. Okay. I've got my feet pointing towards him, one back, one forward, so I can just dip down a little bit. And he's got a nice convex surface here on the left-hand side. I support the device gently touching, and I'm now moving it a millimeter at a time with my right hand. And he is continuing to breathe through normal tidal breathing. So I'm now very, very, very close. I think we've now touched, so we'll call that a measurement. And we slide it back and I take the measurement value. Okay? So, <clears throat> key points. And the other thing you have to remember to do is slide this back up to the start. After you've made another measurement, you've then found it's halfway down here and you haven't actually got anything you can use. Okay? So, um, we're going to do exactly the same again. So, I'm just going to say, so... We check his feet position, his hand position against his thigh, and most importantly, his elbows touching the torso. He's looking straight in front of him. He's continuing to breathe normally. I'm wider than his shoulders. One foot forward, one foot back. I'm just lowering myself so I'm a comfortable height to see it. And then as I approach his skin surface, I'm just moving this a tiny bit at a time, and I'm looking along the edge of it so I can actually see when it touches, just there. Okay, so that would be a, a first go at a measurement experience for you. So in the next sort of couple of minutes, it's, it's probably worth seeing if people have got the right apparel to, uh, to measure in pairs, and we'll just get some measuring practice and then obviously we're going to mix up the pairs as, uh, as that elapses. Okay? We happy with that? Perfect. Maybe one to two millimetres you are compressing yeah. here. It's very, very hard not to do. But if you think about it, if I am on this disc and the disc is on the deltoid, then it's that bottom section, not the middle of the disc, which is actually on his deltoid in this case. Mm. In some people it will be the middle, in some people it's the bottom. But in the, yeah, we're, this is a moot point, it makes maybe two millimeters of difference. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, you know, I'm seeing this because you've already got a very good grasp of it. So maybe one more and then swap around. <clears throat>
I think you could go in deeper because if I were looking at this disc from the side, that disc should be right over the arm. You were, st yeah, so there. And again, you can see it's touching here. Okay. So it's behind the midline of the body. Um, That's really, good, really nice. Yeah. And then you try and keep it horizontal. It's not, there's a lot to do. Just remember the first time you got behind the wheel of a car. There's just 17 things you have to remember at once. There's only three or four things here. I wonder that, that you were compressing a tiny bit here. You could go a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the disc, when seen from the side, should be covering the arm. And some people's arm is, it won't be big enough and some will be plenty big enough. But most people are coming in too little. You, you need to come in slightly, maybe a centimeter deeper. The other thing I'm going to suggest is that you support the weight of the disc with your middle finger. Mm -hmm and then that is kind of fixed but not compressing and then you can focus all of your effort onto to just looking along the air and what i liked was moving the device one millimeter at a time that was really nice um, but i think you can make it you have more confidence that you're getting the truth when you you know that end is taken care of you can focus on the moving end So we might start with a best practice measuring and then a few things to avoid, which will go into the film, which uh, might be a useful aid memoir when it comes to your last practice. Um, <clears throat> it's like when you're teaching skiing, you can characterize by really exaggerating what not to do and what to do. So. Uh, I'll try and make it easy, um, but what I'm referring to, I mean, I very much like what I see in terms of your own measuring engagement. You're all taking this very seriously. So there's not an awful lot for me to comment on, but what I'll try and do is exaggerate the tiny imperfections that I see so that they're actually more obvious. And particularly when it comes to you training other people, you need to be able to spot them and to give uh, appropriate coaching as well. We'll start with the best practice one. Okay, so feet together, elbows in by the side, convex surface, breathing normally, supporting the disc, moving it in, and then looking along the line. Okay, right, now we're going to do something that I'll, uh, I'll maybe get you to just hang your arms in that position. And I'll... That's a different number. That's good. This time I'll stand too far away, so get your arms in the right position.
This time I'm going to leave the cursor in the wrong place. That's it. I'm not going to do this time. I'm going to make it squint. So I'm clearly below the triceps on this side. This time I'll make it straight, but I will compress the shoulders so you'll see this sort of pressed ham effect you can see in the butchers. Yeah. And it's gone down by a centimetre and a half. Okay. And then a common mistake not going in deep enough so the very edge of these discs is just just where I want to be measuring yeah. and I'm trying to think what else I'll do I'll maybe make it squint in this direction now so it's it's horizontal but it's rotated so my left hand is in the correct position, my right hand isn't, or the right caliper isn't. And that again gives me a funny result. I'll do one more correct one, so elbows nice and tight. Perfect, okay. Thank you, PG. Right, just as a, a briefing, <coughs> we were covering some of those common mistakes that you will see and you will need to be able to recognize not just in yourself, but in the people you're trying to coach. So two most common ones, you're too far away from the person, so everything is slightly harder. It's not impossible, but it's harder. So your lead foot just in front of their feet, that's a good, Way, and then you've got that latitude to move in and out depending on where your <coughs> eyes are able to focus. Um, probably the most common one of all is compressing too much. You want to touch but not compress and it's very hard to do. If you're supporting it in your left hand, you, you, you inevitably are compressing a tiny, tiny bit but we must then just touch it with the right hand, not compress it with the right hand. So you're more likely to be under measuring than over measuring because you're compressing. So it's something to try and recognize. So if you're measuring the same person, they say, well, why can't I get consistent results? I'm getting a 47.5, 48.2, 48.1, 47.3. The higher numbers are more likely to be correct, providing the positioning is correct because they will be the ones without compressing. Very few people will fail to touch the shoulders and then think they are. It's more like they are touching, but they're compressing as well, okay? Um, just check the alignment. Um, occasionally it's off horizontal. It really doesn't make much difference to the numbers. Again, if you remember your geometry from school days, then you know, you've got such an acute angle because this is a fraction of a degree non-horizontality doesn't actually make much difference to the, the, the measurement. Um, you need to be quite a long way off horizontal before it will, but it does mean that you can have the disc which is off the deltoid muscle. And again, as a guideline, you want to certainly be above the midpoint between the elbow and the shoulder, the acromiali of the shoulder. So you, the deltoid, again, this leaf shape, doesn't quite reach the midpoint of that upper arm. So some people might be too low and it's still touching a bit that is too low. So just that's other points. So I'll just carry on with my um, <clears throat> slideshow. Um, in terms of recording the measurement, we, we can record straight into Vantage if you have a Vantage login, but we can transcribing, 
it perfectly um, straightforward. You can do it in paper copy. You can do it directly onto a spreadsheet. It's easy to overwrite calculations in an Excel spreadsheet in error. So you need to know where the undo button is in Excel. You also need to uh, be able to trust what you've done. So you need to record the file name, usually with a date suffix. So I th I've run these exams a lot. So today's date will be the suffix for this particular measuring exam, which will have a record of your measuring in it. We see a lot of 47. We don't see 47.0 because I need to know that you have measured 2.0. So 47.0. So even if it is exactly 47 centimeters, it goes in as 47.0. Okay. Um, the spreadsheet, as I've said, will calculate if they're more than 1% different. And I'll show you that in the, on the spreadsheet themselves. Are we sorted? Are we? Okay. Um, okay. Can you, 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 can you come up with a person to remeasure? And I'll just carry on for now. So you can do it manually, but you've then got to calculate 1%. It's not very difficult to calculate 1%. Are they 1% different? So <clears throat> for a 47 centimeters by deltoid breadth, it's 4.7 millimeters. So if they are more than four millimeters different, then you need to remeasure. Okay. Um, we can have a measure ID. When you get a license to be a trainer, you will get a unique identifying number and you need to sign off any ma manual sheets um, that you have. So this is the calculation that we've had here. And in this case, we have a manual sheet where it can, you put one number in each box, but you can have the entire number in these, as I was showing you earlier, and it calculates it and it does the designated outcome with a 95% confidence limit based on your measuring. So this is an XBR and it says quality assured if it is easily an XBR. Um, um, or if it's too close to that threshold, um, it will come back uh, with something different. A uh, non-XBR 52.9, okay? Uh, so we have quality assured appears when we are more than 97.5% uh, confidence that the true measurement is not an XBR. So that will come up in the, the Excel spreadsheet. But if what we're measuring is close to the threshold, we are less than 97.5% uh, certain that the true value is less than or equal to 55.9 because we're just within that. So we are 54.7 here. That's just on the cusp of being significant. Um, so um, running the, the measuring exam, ideally you want, seven or eight candidates. Here we've got five, but we've had PG. So on your behalf, I would like to thank him for spending the morning with us. Make sure you can, um, everybody introduces each other. Again, you're all professionals, so you don't have problems with confidence, probably. You can deliver the, 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 the lecture, which is all there for you, and stop at slide 14. I think I stopped at slide 15, but you then show them the theory, get them measuring in practice using the devices. You provide some instruction and just a small number of clearly articulated points, the ones we've been measuring. Many people are compressing, they're not deep enough, they're not level. Um, you know, perhaps the, um, the devices squint or something like that, feet are too far away, for instance. They get some practice on everybody else in the room um, and then you, as the examiner, call people in, you measure them, you then make a note of them, they go into the spreadsheet as the correct answer, okay? Um, you then explain the procedure for the exam. You have exam sheet A, exam sheet B, they complete it, hand it to you, you enter it in. So using the exam spreadsheet, this is the, the first sheet in the workbook here, where I'm entering the numbers. These are not today's exam, 
um, the bideltoid breadth measured once, twice, and three times. It calculates the mean or the median, and it puts that into the spreadsheet as the correct answer. And a different colored panel for each person that you measure. So here I have measured six people today, okay? So the trainer's measures are transcribed onto sheet one as the criterion um, for the candidate assessment, which is the next sheet. So the next sheet in the spreadsheet are the correct answers for this particular exam. And uh, in, in our case today, these ones are bogus and you can overwrite them, which is why it's really important to, to save the Excel spreadsheet as a, as a separate um, date suffixed file so you don't lose information that might be valuable. And then each subsequent sheet in the workbook has a, a sheet for each candidate. So I would normally write their first names to run the exam and I know who they are ahead of time so I have that all prepared first. And all they have to do is measure three people for the exam and I can choose which three because in any group there'll be some people who are easy, some people who are less easy to measure and we want to make sure that people are equipped. We don't automatically give them the easiest people to measure but by the same token we definitely don't want to make them fail because they've just had difficult people to measure. So we have measured person A, B and C and you can pull the numbers of that original spreadsheet um, that panel, these are numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, up to nine. So um, you can choose who you're having that person examined for. So that's what I have to choose. You get three people that you can measure. And if somebody's right on the cusp of passing or not passing, we can perhaps choose a different person and uh, see if we have a different outcome. In order to pass, they have to um, measure with themselves time um, sheet A, sheet B for the same person, A, B, A, B. And it calculates this technical error of measurement as an absolute score in centimetres and a percentage score in centimetres. And you need to get a point to meet the targets in each. So intra and inter refer to those target scores. So this person has passed and they get two out of two and the exam um, sheet will say passed on it uh, once it's active. And then to conclude the exam, you, you, you try and have some help if you're working against the clock. You assemble the group and you try and announce the passes and fails. But it's important, it's not a fail, it's a not yet passed. And you want them to leave there with competence. And if within your measuring window, and again, people might have traveled to your event, and you don't want to send them back on a flight to Schiphol Airport or wherever, um, you want to make every opportunity to make them competent so that they can pass without changing the technical competence required. So give them extra coaching and give them another opportunity for measuring if that proves necessary, okay? And then you can provide a submission spreadsheet um, so that the certificates can be issued. And th the certificates have undergone a little bit of evolution since this. Is that still the case, Emily? Okay, so we, we have a certificate which has, it may not have these wonderful illustrations in it, but you, you have a measurer's certificate. And again, there'll be a date, there'll be a license number for each person. It usually has my signature as well. My professional body that I'm in is the International Society for the Advancement of Kin Anthropometry. Um, but so it also has a different um, one for the trainers as well. So yours will not easily be confused with a measurer's certificate. So you will have a trainer's certificate. So there's a unique identifier. It links to the person and um, you will have that which will be on the certificates um, and the measurers also have a, a measure ID and you won't be able to have the same ID as a trainer. Um, th that will go into Vantage. So when you are a measurer, it's important when you're empowering these other people to put numbers into Vantage that we get the right information. So identity checking. 
Um, it's not likely that people will pretend to be somebody other than they are, but you still have to check they are who they are. Um, suitability of clothing. If they cannot present themselves in a suitable fashion to be clothed, you don't measure. In particular for women, they can't be measured in underwear and they certainly can't be measured in nowhere. So they need a sleeveless top or you don't measure them. Okay, it's that serious, okay? I'm not for me. I think basically my encouragement would be this is a professional measuring scenario. People should be clad decently as if you could appear in a public beach if we had a better climate than we do. So, so you, you would want this person to be able to appear in public wearing what you're wearing to measure in. Okay? It is different for men. It is different from men measuring women. And we have to be absolutely squeaky clean. What we're not going to do is have any potential for accusations of misconduct. So if they're not wearing the appropriate apparel, we don't have to measure. And then the default will be XPR. And that's, you know, I think that's the right thing to do, to be honest. And people might say, well, that's very British. But British will keep you in a job if there is a potential for, um, you know, let's say, the wrong sort of information getting, you know, um, let's say, blown out of proportion. So again, it's measuring two or three times, two if they're within 1%, three if they're not. Um, the, the spreadsheet will calculate the recorded measurement automatically for you, sign it, enter it into Vantage, but make sure above all else, all the information you collect has a s storage that is secure. Whether it's a paper copy or an electronic copy, there is a risk that a pen drive will be left in a PC. A piece of paper will be left in a lecture theater in this case, with somebody's name and their numbers on it. So this, according to our Data Protection Act, is actually a serious violation. So people are entitled to anonymity and confidentiality, and secure storage of data is part of it. Okay, common sense, but you know we need to be careful with those um, uh, details. Right. I'm delighted to be able to say you have all passed the measuring exam, so you are competent measurers. I think the key points really are mostly the, the obvious, and you have to just organize the time. Again, we're nearly up to our three hours. I've tried not to push you too fast. There's a tendency to think, oh, we've got to get cracking, and you're too soon into the exam and people haven't had the time to experiment, try things, see the way they work, for you to fault correct enough. And part of it is giving them that space early on and not rushing them into the exam. But also, if, they've, if you've undergone the exam yourself, it's fairly obvious what I've done. It's actually not rocket science at all. The electronic information is all there so that you can just present the slideshow and run the spreadsheet for the exam itself. And of course, before you deliver one of these training events, familiarize yourself with what you're going to be doing as the tools of your trade, if you like. Um, but essentially, what we're trying to do is ensure that people pass, provided they deserve to pass. And everybody in this room really does deserve to pass. Okay? But what we're trying to do is to understand how easy it is to drift high, low compression. And you know, some people will buck the trend. I think we usually find people com compressing a tiny bit, which means they're kind of under measuring. But some people do the opposite. Um, and, and you're quite right to challenge me on my sort of impression on, is this right, is this right? Um, and some people are just plain difficult to measure. And you think, where is the deltoid there? But your sort of knowledge of anatomy should be that if I'm more than halfway between the shoulder and the elbow, I'm below where the deltoid is. There may be a bulge, but it's not the deltoid. So where the deltoid comes to is usually two-fifths of that distance. 
And even if it's a funny shape, it's a funny shape because of the triceps, not the deltoid, you have to measure to that height, that level, uh, if you like. So it's the bottom edge of the disc. In some people, you do get this wonderful convex surface and it's really easy. You can put that surface right in the middle of these discs. But in many people, it's the bottom edge of the disc because the lower you measure, the bigger the numbers. Okay. So most of it is common sense. It isn't rocket science, but you just need to be confident that you've got the knowledge, the experience, and the tools to deliver the training. Do you feel you've got that confidence? I would like you to walk out of the Syrian wood building confident and happy that I'm happy that you've got what you need. In terms of the practicalities, you do need available space, you need reasonable ambient lighting, but if you're projecting, you need you know, to be able to see the screen. In general, you need two and a half square meters, two and a half meters by two and a half meters in which to measure somebody without a risk of you bashing into the walls and various things. You need some table space to put instruments, note taking, etc. So you need a flexible space. Um, we've done it once, as Emily might remember, in a room that was barely big enough for it, but it was all we could get because there were student teaching and exams on. And yes, we ran it, and it wasn't easy, but take time to arrange the sort of layout of the room appropriately. One of my ideas was to go offshore and yeah. deliver it, but only probably to two personnel. Um, yeah. Is that, I know you're saying obviously ideally um, you need this many, is that going to be kind of... Well, you, in, in order to be authentic, you would like enough variety of shoulders, and we've got great variety here, um, in order to be authentic. So you can have people measure you, but if that only means they're only getting two people... I mean, they could bring other people Yes, that's, in, the, that's the key. they're not being trained to be a measurer, yeah. I could ask yeah. more personnel to come in to yeah. be measured. Yes. Like yeah. Bit, um, yeah. And that's, that's what I think you have to do. I would say, as a minimum, you kind of need six people, six bodies, and so you're measuring at least five other people and preferably more than that. So if you got the chance, and you will need them for, well, we've needed PG for what, a long time, but because of there's an exam. Um, so you will need them in case somebody doesn't get through to, to have a re-coaching opportunity. But it may be that if you're offshore for a number of days, you're not going to plan on doing this as a day visit, or are you going to stay out there? Or? Um, I, I think I was planning on day visit. I'm yeah. sure for a day or two and get the changeover of yeah. the personnel as well. That's it. Yeah. If you can do that and incentivize people so that you know you've got bodies to measure, that's a way forward. And it's good to get people who are a challenge to measure, particularly for a trainer's course, because because I don't want you feeling we've made it as easy as it can be. And by the way, you're going to be training people who might be measuring far harder than that. So we want to give you a challenge to make that experience as authentic as possible. Clint? I was just going to say, how, how do you teach? Um, how would you instruct if you've got people in the class that are not prepared that would do the correct code? It can't, can't, you can't do it. You have to have enough people who are willing to be measured. To measure and be measured, or else they can't be it. Yeah, we're trying to make a scheme that won't be necessary in a few years because all the helicopters will have wide windows. Um, but we're not there yet. And we need to at least do the right thing for a number of years to come, but not sort of indefinitely. I think this process will not be necessary, certainly in a decade and possibly in five years, I don't know. Well, on behalf of RGU and Step Change, we'd just like to thank you for coming along. What was really encouraging for me was you're all straight into the syllabus and the work. 
you took us seriously. And as a lecturer, it's always nice to be taken seriously by people who've come on, you know, an instructional course. So yes, you've been very attentive, you've been very hard working. You've got the result that you wanted and we just uh, hope that this qualification is going to be of use to you and you will put it to good use. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.